Okay. I do have one long. Is this might be better for you. All right. Instead of using that uh, podium mic. The only thing with this stupid thing. We're streaming that, but is this going out to the room? Yeah, it's out to the room out? too. This is going to the room. Yeah, this okay. is going to make it go out to the room well, okay. and to the headsets. Okay. The PA is very faint because the show management doesn't want it super loud. Okay, that's fine. But we're going to do this. I got to attach this. This is not a great log. And I want to not make it bounce. All right. Like that. So we're going to do it. That way. Uh, why don't you take your lanyard off just so it doesn't bump into the microphone? Sorry, you get your uh, surround your uh, thing. Sorry about that. Okay, later. All right, let's just get this piece of tape in here. I just did a quick test on this. So, this is going to be the first time we're using this stupid lav. <laughs> this lav is a little flimsy. I didn't want to use it today, but all right. Let's watch it right on for a second. And I'm just going to touch this on the side okay. somewhere. Yeah, you may think it's fine if that's right for you. Yep. I got it a little lower right now, okay? But I'm gonna bring it up. Uh, let's say we need it like this. Okay. I'm storing it. And exactly. Uh, Contrast should be good. I'm hoping this is gonna be good. Also, this headset. So does it get any slack in there? No slack in the headset. I'm just gonna take this off yeah. just in case. Worst comes to worst, I'll bring this mic up and turn that one off. If that All one right. doesn't work right, so we'll keep them both here. Okay. So, welcome everybody. My name is Mike DeFeo. Uh, I generally work in the animation industry and uh, doing maquettes and sculpts for creatures like for Ice Age and uh, robots, Horton Here's a Who, Minions, um, and those kind of movies. But my background is in uh, basically special effects makeup. I always loved doing. Um, so these are some of the things I normally do. Uh, but I've always had a passion for stop motion and uh, prosthetic makeups and that sort of thing. So I was able to work with a, a friend at uh, IMAX. We're gonna get a little bit of feedback. Rock and roll. Uh, so it's a makeup uh, show and, sorry, I'm gonna have to like, there we go. And so I was hired to do a little sculpting at that show, and I did this uh, demon guy, and this was in clay. Now all the stuff I do is basically digital. And so I was working with a guy by the name of Josh Torrey, uh, and he's a really great makeup artist, and we were just talking about sculpting, traditional and digital, and all the different ways that you can uh, combine the two, and what can be done in the future. And so I started working with him at his shop, and after having done years and years of uh, ZBrush and digital stuff, I was finally able to like start making weird monsters in clay again. Just brief little gigs here and there. And uh, during our time at his shop, we started talking about 
how can we use ZBrush and 3D printing to experiment with advancing doing prosthetics? Um, and so we decided to do this test of basically scanning my head or my face and building a prosthetic and making molds from that and then running an actual physical uh, silicone prosthetic. So we did this whole uh, pitch, uh, or I should say this project, documented it, and we had it in this issue of Prosthetics Magazine. I'll just skim through it real quick. I'm just going to talk a little bit and I'll do a couple of quick demos. So these are basically the articles. There's Josh down there at the bottom. Good guy, look him up, Josh Torrey. Uh, he's on Instagram and has really great stuff. So the thought was, how can we use ZBrush and 3D printing to help either speed up or find new ways to deal with actual physical prosthetics? So this, as you can see, is sort of the, the equivalent of what you would do in clay where you have a plaster copy of your nose, then you sculpt the clay nose on that, and you add various uh, other bits of clay to that for escape for the silicone and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to sort of go through this in ZBrush here in a minute, but this will give you a quick overview. So I took a scan of my face, took that little piece you can see in the lower left corner, floated it, attached it to a cylinder, and then from there I sculpted the nose and then created an area for that uh, silicone to go when we actually make the mold. And then on the bottom you can start seeing some of the uh, experiments we did with the honeycomb and various ways to make the mold lighter, more uh, less expensive and, and durable. So these are the first two prototypes we did and they ended up becoming a lot more durable than that. And then the article goes into the actual creation of it. So here you see the final printed molds. I printed them on a MakerBot at the higher resolution. Um, I wanted to try to keep the cost down as much as possible. Uh, and then you can see once that was printed, you have these two parts and you go through a whole bunch of alchemy to put in various types of silicones and you squish it together and when you pull it apart you can see in the upper right uh, the, the nose appliance that then gets peeled off and uh, stuck on my mug. Uh, so this is basically what I'm talking about today um, and I wanted to show you a couple of just close-ups of it. So here's the first prototype mold we did. It was a little thinner. And then the one on the right, or I should say the top two, are the first prototype, and then we beefed them up on the bottom one. Uh, the one thing I was concerned about was because I was trying to use a, a, a form labs, or I should say a, a, a maker bot just to keep costs down, was that uh, what was that resolution going to look like in the actual appliance? And so here's a, here's a close up of the inside of the mold. And there's a lot of little, a lot of little build lines and boogers and artifacts from the printing. We just knocked off the really sharp little bits, but other than that, we ran it straight out of the mold, uh, just right off the machine. And to my surprise, I, mostly because of the, the uh, translucence of the material. Let's see if I can go back. There we go. Um, because of the translucence of the material, you really couldn't see any build lines at all. It was pretty crazy, uh, straight out of the straight off the printer, basically. So there's, the, if you could see any build lines, it really just sort of registered as uh, skin texture, really, which is pretty crazy. So I think that's it. All right. And I'm gonna try to go into ZBrush and show you a couple of files. And that is not me. I'll just start. Here. So basically the idea was to see what we could get away with and, and a funny little story was while we were in his shop and we did that first run, we were poured up the silicone and we were letting it cure and then as we were pulling it apart we were talking to another friend who uh, was who's a, pra a practical you know, physical sculptor, does makeup and he was a little bit kind of curmudgeonly about it like ah it's not going to work, it's not going to work. So as we're prying this thing open we opened it up and looked in and the cutting edge, which I'll show you in a second, the thinness, the thin part that blends to the skin was perfect. And we looked over at the guy and like, just said, uh, yeah, it, it came out perfectly. And he was just like, no. But it, you know, the thing is, it's not like it's taking over a makeup artist's job or whatever. The whole point of the project was how to 
uh, use these tools to help. Uh, you can obviously with digital, you can edit things more quickly. You can run multiple molds for like when you're doing a whole series of prosthetics. Sometimes you need a lot of molds to keep up with the quantity of the shoot, etc. So you know, it's kind of was just done as an experiment. It's really kind of. Uh, it's somewhat practical, but it's not quite uh, there yet with, with, you know, the various, uh, here we go, the, with the various costs of things. It's getting close, but it's, this is more just an experiment of seeing, like, you know, can we do it? Okay, so here is the first prototype, and uh, let me just turn off some things here. Okay, so this is three things going on here. There's the, the core, sorry. This is like my face. And on top of that is the clay. And so obviously between those two will be a negative when we get to that. And then this part is what's called the flash. So when the molds go together, this little exposed area, I think you can see my mouse. Uh, this is where the two molds touch and it creates a very thin edge for the appliance to uh, to work uh, and, and blend in your skin. Then also we have the keys, so those need to be exposed. And let me put another. And this one. All right. So here is this is the final mold right here. So basically, it is the positive minus that clay part. I took that and extracted off of it to create this negative. And then also I created this uh, webbing here. I started with this circular pattern here just as an experiment, but uh, I thought that using this honeycomb could be even more efficient. So, the buttons on this thing, I never use this in teak. So give me a second. I'm gonna have to move the... Uh, keyboard over here. All right. So yeah, so this is basically what I ended up sending to the printer. So I wanted to show you a, a quick concept of how I did this. Uh, I'm sure there's a million different ways to do it out there. But Essentially, I have my scan data, and then I took a cylinder, and the idea was to float them into each other, uh, and of course, obviously, it's intersecting, so once I put them together, I could pull down, you know, these areas here. I can, let me get my, there we go. You know, then I could smooth all this out. and I ended up with something like this. So I'm only really concerned about the nose because that's where the appliance is gonna go. I put a few keys in here. This is gonna be for registering the negative once we pull it. But then what I did was I took this uh, model here, I duplicated it, and I put them in two different colors. Uh, the thought being that I could then see the uh, clay as it's being built. But what I wanted to do is just shrink this down a little. Just give it a little negative inflate. So it's now I'm looking at the plaster essentially. And then, so what I do now is as I sculpt, the green clay essentially is coming through. Now, my symmetry is not so good right here, but. So you can basically, the, the good part is it's already very close to the surface by just duplicating it, obviously. And I won't go too far with this, just kind of give you the idea. So a couple of tricks are, you want to keep this sculpture as it tapers off into the face very close. So I'll just like do a quick smooth, and obviously you can do all the various sculpting techniques. We ended up using alphas for poor texture and that sort of thing. 
but one of my concerns was how to how to do my blend. So for example, as this surface of the new face, the new skin will come off onto the my face or the actor's face, you want to have a nice soft uh, gradual transition. I mean you could build it up so that it's you know if it's a very obvious form, but once that gets glued down you're gonna see that uh, that line. So, you know, one cool thing you can do is rough out your sculpture and then use, like, uh, where are you? I would do this often. I would use Z-Project. Oops. Do that. Turn off color. So I'd use Z-Project uh, to try to get it nice and tangent to the surface. Then I would go back. And I would do this basically all the way around, take my time. And go back and forth and then continue sculpting and eventually I can blend this all off and now I know that this is this whole section here is pretty tangent to the the negative so then I can come back and start to cut away and get it closer So then, you know, I would just crank away at this thing and I'm not going like, to try to like rebuild it here. But uh, the cool thing about it is just to think the whole time I'm doing this is to think of it as if it's real clay. So that was one of the reasons I would do the color this way. But I do need to think about when it gets molded and what's going to happen to various parts. Let me just turn off symmetry for a sec. For example, when you're doing a sculpt like this, you have to remember that the actor's going to need to breathe, so you have to kind of come in here and carve out nose holes and that sort of thing. Get in there. So you have to get back down to the plaster where the nose is. And then you also have to consider the thickness of the clay. At a certain point, you know, you gotta make sure that, you know, that you can see that your mold's not gonna lock up. So for example, if this were plaster right now, let me actually go in here a little bit more. If this were a mold and it was wrapped around here, the uh, plastic or plaster would catch on this nose flange. So you have to keep in mind actual physical properties of how materials work and, and the engineering of drafting and that sort of thing. So it was a little bit more than just doing a regular uh, sculpt. You have to think about the, the actual physical use of it. Uh, so once I have something like that that's pretty good, which this is not, but you know, you get the idea. Then I would need to make the, uh, the flash. So the flash is where your excess material flows away. Basically what I did there was just go on to the positive, this is called, this part is the positive, and obviously the other is the negative. And I would use, yeah, there we go. And I would just mask, like, essentially where the flash is going to go. And I'm not going to do this whole thing, but mask around it and I'll do basically an extract off of that. And so, you know, I would do it obviously much cleaner, <laughs> much more time than that. But then I had that piece, which was the equivalent of this guy right here. And then once I had all of that together, I would essentially take the sculpture and the flash and the positive and uh, combine them, do an extract off of that. And once I had that thickness, this is kind of how this thing worked. Where are you? There you go. So basically, 
this negative is the flash. You can see the keys where the positive touch, you can see that cutting edge where the positive touch, and the sculpture. So I basically did an extract off of that whole thing, which created like a little web that you can see in there. So it's basically about a, a quarter inch thick extract. And then on that, I built the uh, honeycomb. It's made a little honeycomb mesh and a cylinder around that. And I used live bullions to cut away the excess, merged all that, and that became my negative. And so these two things fit together. So here's just the positive. Sorry, get this back. So this piece is just the positive. Let's see if I can. This piece is just the positive. So again, that's my face. When you clamp these two together, it's going to touch where all these keys are. It's going to touch along this thin little quarter inch cutting edge. And everything else in the middle is going to be a void. And that's where you pour the silicone in, clamp it, peel it out, and then you've got your prosthetic. So basically, that was the whole uh, experiment. And it went well. And we've done a bunch of different um, uh, tests with it for other types of materials and other types of molds. I guess the upshot of it was it was successful, but the question is how practical is it? I mean, the printing these molds were I think about a hundred bucks a piece to print from a service. I didn't have a printer to do it. But other than that, the other hurdle was the fact that uh, any shop that's going to want to do this, any makeup shop, is either going to have uh, an on-site ZBrush modeler, or uh, the, the artist himself needs to be as good at as prosthetics as they are as digital. So it's kind of a thing where you have to have a little bit of either multitasking or ability to do both ends of it. But uh, I think more and more artists are picking up ZBrush, more and more sculptors, and, and even uh, I think some of you people may know who uh, Rick Baker is, legendary makeup artist. He's fully embraced ZBrush and does amazing work with that. And a lot of people are doing molds these days. I mean, that's uh, not like it's anything that new, but it's the first time I think that somebody was like, stupid enough or <laughs> curious enough to go and do an actual silicone two-part prosthetic mold like that. Um, it's just very complicated, but I'm sure now I, there are fancier ways to do it with all the cool brush tools. In fact, I've got to talk with Joseph about it because I'm sure there's stuff in here that I don't even know about. But uh, basically, that's that was the whole thing. We were just trying to do something because it hadn't been done yet. Like I said, other negative molds, slush molds, uh, things like that have been done, and, and even molds of cores and various things. Um, but just this specific thing using gel-filled silicone appliances was like, why not? Let's do it. So anyway, that's about it. Um, now, is there any questions or anything? Or anyone have any, any questions? Yeah. What did I scan with? I used, actually, it's funny, in that slideshow, you see me using an EVA handheld scanner, which is a great scanner, but I didn't have it at the time. So I, had a, I had a next engine scanner, so I just put my face in front of it. I don't know if you guys know what the next engine, it's a little box, and it, it's good for product and stuff, but I just kind of worked with what I had. So it did a pretty good job, and uh, the volumes were all there. I didn't need to have a lot of detail, because normally when you make these molds, you know, you're using a a life cast, you're using alginate or silicone to pull life cast, and by the time you get to the place where you have a positive like that, all the details pretty much, not all of it, but a lot of it's gone. So I didn't need poor texture so much and, and that kind of thing. Uh, while it's always helpful, it usually kind of goes away. So that using the next engine in a sort of hack like that was, it worked. So, yeah. Say it again, it's hard to hear, I'm sorry. You know, I don't, they were pretty dense because I wanted to keep the edges crisp specifically. Uh, so I don't, I don't keep track of numbers. It was just enough that my machine wouldn't crash. <laughs> it, was up, it was up there, especially on the nose because it had a ton of pore texture. Um, but uh, yeah, and, but it, you know, I get, I, I usually kind of crank it up, but um, yeah, basically I just crank it till, till it doesn't burn. Any other questions? 
Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I can't. It's it's loud up here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. I cannot hear a thing. How long did the 3D printing process take? Well, they were. I went to uh, I went to this company in Brooklyn called Voodoo, and they have uh, tons of machines there. And they, if I went with the rush, I could have got it overnight. You know, it was they're, they're fast over there. Um, and also, it's the FDM printers, and they're those are pretty quick. You know, but uh, which I was thinking of using it for Labs, which does great great job. But it was really kind of a question that part of this experiment was how to do it the least expensive way possible. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? All right, then. I think we're going to wrap it. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks very much.